Hi, you are watching Procurement and Supply Chain Live, and this session features Sanya Kankar Todorovic of Home Capital Group. With more than 20 years of experience in large global organizations, Sanya is a passionate customer experience, strategy and transformation leader, specializing in driving technological innovation, agile digital transformation, corporate culture evolution, and cost and quality streamlining via outsourcing, offshore and nearshoring, global procurement, strategic sourcing, vendor management, and third party risk management. I think that covers pretty much everything, doesn't it? Um, in her current role at Home Capital, uh, Sanya leads the enterprise procurement, outsourcing, and vendor management function. Sanya is a vocal advocate of diversity in business and has spent a number of years volunteering as a corporate mentor to women and, mon and uh, minority owned business and can often be found at different events advocating for corporate supplier diversity programs. So a great guest for us today and welcome to the show, Sanya. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I feel honored and privileged to be part of Procure Procurement Live 2022. So for the next half an hour or so, I'm going to talk about an important topic here, the total value of ownership or TVO. So over the last decade, and particularly since COVID-19 pandemic, procurement function has evolved from an enablement role to a strategic partner function across most organizations. The traditional measures of success for procurement and supply chain was always tied to value for money or VFM. So things like cost savings, cost avoidance, and labor arbitrage in the BPO and ITO space. That outdated concept is now replaced by the total value of ownership, or TVO, recognizing that the bitter taste of poor quality lasts a lot longer than the sweetness you get from the initially cheap price. The most successful transformations achieve the desired outcomes by focusing on strategic partnership management as opposed to traditional vendor management approach, basing their supply evaluation criteria on the following. Third-party risk management, reliability, sustainability, compliance, quality, reciprocity, and cost. Now, just for the comparison purposes, this is TBO. The traditional approach of value for money, or VFM, was really focusing on that 15% of the iceberg that we see here on the picture which is mostly focusing on cost alone. So let's dig a dip deeper through all of these just to get a better understanding of what they all mean. Digital transformation that virtually all organizations went through since early 2020 was not driven by the CIO, but primarily driven by COVID. Pandemic truly accelerated the fourth industrial revolution that all organizations were tiptoeing around until they were literally just pushed right into it. And it's amazing to see how much things have changed. But with massive changes, we also have massive risk exposure. So things like vendor concentration, fourth party risk management, information cybersecurity, business continuity, reputational risk, and vendor financial health were all check in the box exercises that have moved into an elevated third party risk management uh, program that starts at the vendor evaluation and onboarding stage and is managed through structured, well-defined vendor governance process and continuous risk monitoring. Now, balancing vendor concentration with vendor consolidation is tricky because it is not the same for every organization, nor is it same for every organization within the same industry. The approach must be guided by the organization's risk appetite. While it is not favorable to have one vendor perform most or all functions within the organization, the fact remains that benefits of economies of scale are achieved by doing just that. Thus, it's crucial that all organizations have a well-defined and communicated risk appetite that will drive the scoring of this criterion. The fourth party risk management has been gaining a lot of traction as well. This implies that in addition to continuous monitoring of the third party risk, organizations should also monitor their vendors' vendors. This requirement alone has put a significant pressure on procurement and vendor management functions, resulting in bigger teams with enterprise risk management 
in addition to sourcing and vendor management skill set. Nevertheless, understanding the fourth party risk is important criterion in the vendor evaluation process. And with the unprecedented reliance on the IT vendors, information and cybersecurity have climbed to the top of the threat scale. Fortunately, there are many InfoSec tools available that will provide for continuous monitoring of data breaches, but the best defense is still a comprehensive vendor due diligence process. That includes the reviews of the independent InfoSec audits and vendor SOC reports by the organization's IT subject matter experts. And even if the due diligence process checks out, organizations still need to have a well-established exit strategy in the event of the unforeseen circumstances in the future. Now, similarly to InfoSec and cybersecurity, business continuity has also moved from check-in-the-box exercise to an integral part of vendor evaluation process. Choosing to engage vendors with an established business continuity plan that is regularly tested and updated is a winning strategy, especially if the vendor is classified as being critical to the organization. Now, reputational risk is the hardest risk to manage. It is the risk of public impressions, whether true or not, regarding the vendor's business practices, actions, or inactions that will adversely affect vendors' earnings, economic value, capital, or ability to maintain existing relationships. Additionally, depending on the type of public impression, organizations might need a plan of disassociating themselves from the impacted vendor, hence the importance of the previously mentioned exit strategy. Lastly, vendor financial health is another data point used in vendor evaluation process to determine vendors' financial stability. Gathering and monitoring financial information and assessing the financial stability of the potential suppliers can reduce financial risk and increase business confidence. Identifying high-risk suppliers drives better fact-based decisions, including where to source from, if the supplier base needs to be diversified, or if the relationships need to be terminated. Once again, organizations' risk appetite will play a big role in this criterion, as publicly traded versus privately owned vendor companies will have different views on sharing such sensitive information. Nevertheless, uh, this knowledge should impact decisions and help mitigate risk and add value to the organization. So make sure you're discussing vendor finances before tying the knot with your vendor. Now, the next on our docket here is reliability. Vendor reliability should be viewed from two different angles. Will contracting this vendor mitigate any business disruption risks? And does the vendor have an efficient operating model with the reputation of being a good strategic partner that meets their service level agreements? The answers to these will only be achieved by conducting independent vendor reference checks by either connecting to vendors' current customers or better, better yet, turning to your own professional sourcing network for their professional and unbiased feedback. Now, when it comes to SLAs, they are to be negotiated as part of the overall contract negotiations. And my recommendation is to always seek a way to tie in the concept of penalties and rewards into the SLAs. This ensures that everyone has skin in the game to ensure their reliability never suffers and that the SLAs are always met. Sustainability, although a very popular term, will be looked at a bit differently here in the context of TVO. Is the value achieved with this vendor engagement sustainable in the long run? Did the vendor underprice themselves so much so that they will have no choice but to reduce their overhead to compensate for the difference, resulting in decreasing quality and customer support? Or in a different scenario, is the vendor operating model built to withstand the test of time and any turbulence in the market? Does the vendor have an appetite for innovation and are they open to new products, services, or ways of doing business in line with your organization's innovation roadmap? All of the important questions to consider when engaging a new vendor. For compliance, procurement will, and the organization will need to rely on the internal compliance 
and privacy subject matter experts to answer the questions. Will the vendor align to internal policies and governance processes? Are they aligned to the organization values and are they in compliance with applicable laws? It is often recommended to include the organizational standard terms and condition and even the vendor code of conduct right as part of the competitive sourcing process, asking the vendors to sign off on them or provide their red line as part of their proposal that will be assessed during the evaluation process. That will also speed up the process um, of reading up the vendors and actually seeing how much can be negotiated down the road. When it comes to quality, there are no shortcuts with assessing quality. For the vendors um, engaged for sourcing of tangible goods, it is highly recommended to collect samples and have them tested by the independent third-party quality control. For vendors that are being engaged for their services, the quality can be tested by the independent reference checks with current or past customers, or even better, seeking unbiased view from your own sourcing network. There are also options of engaging the vendor through the proof of concept POC agreement or simple trial period in order to assess the quality of services prior to engaging in the long-term commitment. Now for the reciprocity criteria, it's probably one of the most delicate ones because it touches on both the sourcing and the sales targets of the organization. So questions like, does the vendor have any current or future spend with the organization? Is the vendor replacing another vendor that has the spend with the organization? And if so, what is the potential financial impact of the vendor transition? Adding potential impacts of reciprocity numbers, whether positive or negative, will surely paint a very different picture with a holistic view of the total value of ownership. Last but not um, least is the cost. Arguably, this point is last only because it becomes irrelevant if the criteria we already discussed has not been satisfied. But if everything else checks out, the pricing negotiations becomes important as the only tool ensuring direct cost control. When I say cost, I mean the total cost that includes both variable and fixed costs, all up for negotiations. However, this negotiation must result in a win-win outcome. Otherwise, one party, and that's usually the vendor, will walk away feeling cheated. And that will surely be reflected in their deteriorating performance that will further have a domino effect on the organization and the organization's customers. Today, procurement professionals must deliver value across several areas as opposed to only delivering the lowest cost. This new operating model has transformed the procurement function, calling for enhanced skill set, tools, and resources of vendor, category, and sourcing professionals that can drive the procurement supply chain and vendor management strategies and initiatives to create value across the organization, all while influencing buying behaviors and processes consistent with policies, strategies, and best practices. It is safe to say the long gone are the days where the procurement professional and the buyer were interchangeable terms. Thank you. Thank you, Sanya. I was, I was enjoying that quote there at the end from Benjamin Franklin. I mean, there's somebody who clearly knows something about money, right? And value. <laughs> That's right. Uh, now, um, okay, I've got a few questions for you, Sanya. Um, to begin with, how do you drive the cultural change? And that's, uh, you know, viewing procurement function as a strategic partnership instead of an enablement function. How do you drive that? That's a good question, Scott. And, and really what it comes down to is what gets measured gets done. So procurement should always be looking at the ways to demonstrate value to their shareholders. And I think as a procurement function, we have a unique position where you literally have a unobstructed view of the entire landscape of the organization because no other department has the view to see what they're doing in addition to what you know, other departments are also doing. So having that unobstructed view allows us to guide the conversations forward um, and, and therefore provide value in terms of um, letting our, our, our shareholders, sorry, our stakeholders know 
uh, which way to go when they're choosing to engage different vendors. Having a seat at the table is quite important. And I, and I advocate for procurement functions to be reporting into the CFO because that ensures that procurement sees a holistic pitch, picture of the organization roadmap and all of the projects in the pipeline. So how do you guide, how do you change this, this cultural change from the enablement function to the, to the, uh, to the as a more strategic partnership? is always look for the ways to provide value and use, use the position of procurement to guide that conversation and lead the share, shareholders in the right direction when they're making a decision regarding their vendors. Yeah, that's interesting. You talked about, you know, procurement having a, a sort of a, a louder voice, if you like, around the table. Do you think that's something that's happened over the last couple of years for obvious reasons? Yeah, I think the, uh, the last couple and the years to come will um, will continue pushing procurement forward in in the in the area that we are in right now i think the unprecedented reliance on it vendors supply chain issues um and you know shortages of goods and, and services for that matter have really elevated the procurement um as a function and the importance that we deliver so um yeah i absolutely do do see that that has changed over the last years but i also don't think that it's going to stop here it's only going to evolve which what which is why i'm always saying look for the values to further evolve their role and have that louder voice to advocate for the right things that need to be done and reporting into the cfo again a lot of organizations are tying their procurement functions to their actually their bottom line as well so it is it is a very great combination of the two and i see that procurement has a lot more to offer where traditionally it really was just looked at as an enablement role um paper pushers i'm gonna i'm gonna call it that yeah yeah um, so that has really really changed yeah okay great and I'll, I'll ask you another question about the future in a minute um but uh before that um, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to attempt to say this word. You said it perfectly. I'll probably get it wrong. Can you elaborate more on the reciprocity slide that you showed and how procurement can support the sales targets of the organization? It sounds very counterintuitive when you think about it, procurement versus sales. But really, there is there's a synergy between the two. So let's talk about reciprocity first in, in terms of evaluating potential vendors. So um, Let's assume that you have an incumbent and that incumbent is your vendor and you, your spend with that vendor is about $1 million a year. But that vendor is also your customer because they are engaged. They engaged your company to be their vendor for something else that they need. So it's kind of a wash, right? It is a $1 million spend, but they also bring in $1 million in revenue. And let's assume it's been three to five years and it's time to go out to the market and actually um, see what else is out there. And during the RFX process, you actually do determine there's another vendor that can do exactly the same thing as the incumbent, but their cost is 500K less. Now, I think traditionally looking at it, procurement would be like, oh, great, let's just replace the two because we're gonna be saving 500K. Where what I'm advocating for is, no, you've gotta step back and look at the holistic picture because by engaging another vendor to replace the existing one that is also your customer, you are risking losing $1 million of revenue each year. So having a holistic picture will actually determine that, hey, by engaging this new vendor, I will be saving $500,000 $500, a year without actually accounting for any transitional costs that you might incur. But also, I'm going to lose a potential customer here that is bringing in a revenue of $1 million. Now, that looking at it that way, obviously, it's much, much, much wiser to go to the incumbent and say, hey, how can we actually partner to improve the, your performance so you're better matched with this incumbent, um, sorry, with this other vendor that, that you, you noticed during the RFX process, but also keep them as the customer and the incumbent going forward. Now, if you are thinking about reciprocity where you are engaging a whole new vendor and there is absolutely no reciprocity to be, you know, to, to there's no opportunity for reciprocity at that given time, there's other options that you could be looking at in order to, su to support the sales targets as well of the organization. And one of the main things is negotiating the first right of refusal. 
And that's a contractual right to enter into a business transaction with a vendor before anyone else can. So just because there's no opportunity right there and then, this vendor might be looking at an opportunity that could involve your company down the road. And by negotiating the first right of refusal right into the contract, you're almost guaranteed that they will come to you and potentially, if you put your best foot forward, you will win that business as well. So that vendor has the potential of not just being your vendor, but also your customer in the future. Make sense? Makes perfect sense. Um, and talking about the future there as well, let's let's look ahead e even further than the, the time period we, we touched on earlier. How do you see procurement function evolving in the next five to 10 years? And I realize that's a huge window because obviously technology moves so fast and we never know what's around the corner. But how do you see it moving in the next uh, decade? It's funny that you say that because the lifetime of anything technology related it's 12 to 18 months. So that's a cycle, right? Um, and, and things are just moving super fast. And just looking back, you don't need to do anything except to look at the last two years and how things have changed. I think we, I think the first shocker for all of us was the, um, the shortage of PPE that happened in March 2020. Now, it was just, um, and, and I'll, I'll speak from the, from the North American standpoint, but it was the unprecedented uh, demand for something that was um, very inexpensive prior to March 2020, that all of a sudden it became the most expensive thing that you had to get. But even if you if you were you know willing to pay the money, there was no way of getting it to you because the supply chain was just stopped. And I think that was a wake up call for this entire um, entire profession to realize that how unprepared we were for anything catastrophic, as, you know, such as global pandemic. Yeah. So that really accelerated the whole transformation of procurement function. And I think that elevated the actual function within the organization because everyone turned to procurement all of a sudden to, not just for the PP, I'm just giving that as an example because I still can't get over it. But, you know, for everything, everyone just turned to procurement to say, hey, what do we do? What do we do for the tangible goods that we can no longer get because you know, traditionally, the idea was always to have um, just-in-time delivery, so you're not holding on to inventory and occurring extra cost. But now, the the mind, the mind that the, there was a shift in, in the way of thinking that hey, maybe we should be carrying inventory for something like PPE, where it really doesn't cost us a lot. It doesn't take up a lot of space. It doesn't. There's not a lot of not a lot of money that's frozen into it. Maybe we should bring it on and hold on to it. For situations that you know might come up in the future where once again we wouldn't be able to rely in just in time delivery for that also there was a lot of switch again from the north north american standpoint i'm pretty sure it's it's global as well is to look at what can you what can you procure that is actually local so even though from the cost perspective it is a bit more costlier than you know going out and trying to source it from from you know a cheaper alternative the fact that you don't have to rely on the supply chain or you don't have to rely as much has proven to be uh, worth the extra cost of procuring it locally and being able to actually have it right right there and then so i'm just giving examples of how much things have changed for this profession just in the last two years and i don't see that slowing down in the next five to ten years especially as the um, as I said, IT um, life cycle of technology is pretty short, so you've got to stay on top of it. And I mentioned that information security and cyber um, cyber security are the two biggest threats that will only that, that will only remain the threats. Um, it will only it will keep us it will have to keep us sharp to ensure that we are always on top of it and we are actually uh, always searching for the next best vendor that can mitigate as many risks as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, Sanya, that's great insight from you today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, that's all we've got time for. But for now, Sanya, thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Okay, and stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back with the next session.